Hey everybody, welcome to the channel. Michael Noland here and tonight we're going to be talking about the rock band Uriah Heep. Uriah who, you might ask? I'm talking about the legendary, yes, I said legendary rock band, Uriah Heep. You know, I became aware of this band about 1972. At that point, I was aware of their Wizards and Demons album. I was a Beatles fan originally, and that was my idea of what a rock band was. But in 1972, I was 17 years old, and I was ready for a harder edge of rock and roll. Earlier that year, while still in North Carolina, I had discovered Alice Cooper, I had discovered Black Oak, Arkansas, I had discovered Black Sabbath. By the time I got back to California, I was convinced I needed to look into Led Zeppelin, and I bought their Houses of the Holy album. It blew my mind, and from that point on, I was catching up on Led Zeppelin. Right around this time, I became aware of Uriah Heep. Now, Uriah Heep was a big enough band. Of course, Led Zeppelin during those years was ruling the roost with Deep Purple and Black Sabbath nipping at their heels, yet not quite achieving the level that we saw Led Zeppelin achieve. Now, just below those two bands was Uriah Heep, unfortunately third in line. And to tell you the truth, I never understood this. You know, when I discovered this band, I immediately went back and got their Salisbury album, and I was a fan. Now later on, uh, especially once David Byron was gone and away from the band, I did lose interest. I would occasionally look in on them. They were still just as talented as ever, but somehow to me and my ears, they uh, had lost something. But I was a big Ken Hensley fan, and so I would occasionally take a look at them. But the albums that I consider classic rock albums by this band, of course, are on the thumbnail. And these albums uh, require a bit of a suspension of disbelief when you listen to them. I'll, I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. My favorite Queen album, by far, is not Night at the Opera. That would probably be my second favorite Queen album, but my favorite Queen album is Queen 2. You have Side White and you have Side Black, right? And it was a concept album, and there are fairies and ogres galore mentioned throughout this album. All right, so Queen had the Queen 2. I loved it. I was an immediate fan. I saw them at Winterland and went out and bought that album immediately. But then after that, I saw that Led Zeppelin, as I caught up with them, were uh, very much into writing that English countryside mythology-based kind of lyrics, and I was a fan immediately. And with the band, yes, what you had was them writing kind of in that area, but with John Anderson's lyrics, you never knew what universe the guy was inhabiting. And again, those album covers didn't help. Now, I, I mentioned the Yes album covers and Uriah Heep album covers for a very specific reason, and that's because both bands benefited very much from Roger Dean's artwork. When you look at these albums, uh, you would swear it was by the same band, right? Uh, and uh, you might have thought that maybe, just maybe, uh, Uriah Heep was a sub-project belonging to Yes, much like Hot Tuna was for the Jefferson Airplane. Now, I talked about a suspension of disbelief when you approach this band, and by that I mean a lot of the lyrics and a lot of their songs seem to belong to a, a universe slightly ajar from ours, very similar to many of our myths. Wizards and fairies abound galore with this band, and if you can approach a rock band with that in mind and are open to listening to rock music, that's basically based on brand new fairy tales written in song form by this wonderful band. 
Now this band was started off by Mick Box and basically David Byron. It was called Spice. They were getting some interest by record companies. They were ready to do their album. And uh, by the end of 1969, they were ready to uh, attack 1970. First of all, with a brand new member, Ken Hensley, on keyboards, acoustic guitar usually, and sometimes vocals, definitely backing vocals. Now the band added Ken because they were a big fan of Vanilla Fudge and they loved that Hammond organ sound that they would achieve. So they thought, let's bring Ken on and add that to our sound. That was Uriah Heep's defining sound, if you ask me. Now, Ken was important for other reasons. He turned out to be a great songwriter. Other members of the band wrote material as well. And together, all of these members, especially the lineup I'm going to mention here, did, in my opinion, some of rock and roll's most quirky, yet valid, rock and roll albums. So now with Mick Box on guitar, Ken Hensley at the keyboards primarily, and uh, David Byron providing lead vocals, they added their fifth drummer on this album. And of course, that was the magnificent Lee Kerslake and their third bass player as well. Of course, I'm talking about Gary Thane. Past drummers were Alex Napier, Nigel Olson, Keith Baker, and of course, Ian Clark. Past bass players being Paul Newton and Mark Clark. Mark not being related to the drummer Clark, with his name being Clark with an E. But the transition from all of these musicians to the five primary, what I consider to be true canon, Uriah Heep, each and every one of those members were important in helping this band to really develop as a viable band that could tour on the level of, well, at least Black Sabbath and Deep Purple, if not Led Zeppelin. Now, like I said, Wizards and Demons was the first album that I was aware of, and I frantically, after that, went looking for anything that this band had done previously. The first album I bought was Salisbury. Now, Salisbury, if you noticed on my thumbnail, has a different cover than you might be used to, especially if you are from uh, England or anywhere in the European continent. This is the album that they provided for the US. And to tell you the truth, with the tank on the original cover, uh, I don't think I would have liked that. That would have looked like to me that they were ripping off that whole War Pigs look that Black Sabbath had already visited and left. To me, it would have made them look secondhand, but that wasn't the cover that was released here, and I loved it. It was almost like a Leonardo da Vinci uh, anatomy drawing, and it drew me in further. Very heavy and very humble was the name of their first album. That's a silly title, and to tell you the truth, uh, I was getting cooler by the minute, no doubt. Uh, my musical taste were developing, but at 17, if I had seen an album called Very Heavy, Very Humble, I don't think I would have chomped at the bit to get that album. But again, here in the United States, they gave us a brand new cover and they just released it as the album Uriah Heep. So to tell you the truth, I thought this band was great. They already had three wonderful albums and I felt like I had discovered the latest and greatest band in rock and roll. And that's what I want to talk about tonight because uh, I tried like crazy to get my friends to love this band. And the more I would introduce them to them, the more resistance there was. It almost seemed like only rock geeks loved this band, and I, I guess I can understand that to a, to a degree, uh, because uh, like I said, it does take a suspension of disbelief and a certain kind of mindset 
to even listen to songs about wizards and fairies. Let's, uh, let's be honest about that. But, as I've said, I was a big time sci-fi reader and fantasy reader, and I love the fact that some bands would go in that direction. Another excellent band, by the way, who would write in these motifs was the magnificent Moody Blues. And uh, it seemed like later on, though, in the 80s, their so-called reincarnation, they started focusing on writing more radio-friendly, pop-oriented tunes. And really, it gave them a whole second wind. Uh, and I love that incarnation of the band. But I always missed the poems in between tracks. And we're gonna talk about the Moody Blues in the future, I guarantee you. But if you haven't heard of this band, or if you've heard of them, but never really gave them a chance, you might have to put yourself in a bit of a different mindset. Or if you are a sci-fi fan or a fantasy fan, and you have somehow missed this band, I would suggest as the easiest albums to absorb by this band, either Wizards and Demons or The Magician's Birthday, two of Classic Rock's very best albums. All right, folks, that about covers it for tonight. A real quick video, but uh, uh, by the way, the names that you see in front of me all brand new subscribers. If you've seen any of my videos, you know this part. All of these folks have basically subscribed to the tribe and you know how they did it? All they did was hit that subscribe to the tribe button, hit that top bell icon, and of course, with a quick click on that button, you too will be notified of all my future videos. Feel free to share my videos. You know, it's been the sharing of my videos that's responsible for the channel growth. By the way, I will honor all shout outs of any new subscribers up to and including October 28th, 2022, and uh, you will get your shout outs. Like I said, I am behind, and if it's a while before you get your shout out, please understand. That's just one of the reasons that I'm going to be discontinuing this, but we will be offering shout outs on a different level entirely. And we, of course, will get into that uh, very shortly in an upcoming video. A real quick shout out for Rachel's Ghost. You know, Rachel just did a video on Uriah Heep. Take a look at that one over on her channel. And I had had Uriah Heep as an upcoming video, and it was probably gonna be three or four or even five videos from now. But when she focused on this band, I immediately wanted to follow suit because, you know, she's a fan of this band and uh, fans of this band seem to be far and wide, thinned out in the crowd of classic rock fans. And you know what? you'd only be doing yourself a favor by listening to this band. Also, a big shout out to Glenn Kellaway. Thanks for shouting me out in your live stream today, Glenn. I appreciate it. If you haven't had a chance to take a look at Glenn, you know I was surprised. I was watching one of uh, Rachel's live streams and Glenn was there all of a sudden. And I went, wait a minute. I know this guy. I have been subscribed to Glenn's channel for a while now, and I was turned on to him through Canadian Stud Muffin. So if any of you know about him and his humorous approach to rock and roll, you'll know exactly what I mean. Thanks, Glenn, for the shout out. I appreciate it, and kudos to you and your crew. All right, so that's it for the video tonight. I'm Michael Nolan. This is, of course, the bottom line, and I'll see you in my next video.